Oral questions by members? Member for Prince George, Wilmont. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Over eight months ago, masked, axe-wielding assailants violently attacked workers and a construction site on the Maurice River. <clears throat> Last week, eight vehicles, including four RCMP vehicles and an ambulance, were burned in Smithers in another brazen criminal act. Yet there have been no consequences for these attacks, which come on top of the escalating violence and disorder that we see in communities right across British Columbia as a result of the behavior of prolific offenders. Apparently under the NDP, the rule of law no longer matters. So when is this Attorney General going to take some action so that people in our province can begin to feel safe again? Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. I'd like to take this opportunity to point out when she makes an outrageous statement that we don't take public safety seriously, that she should know that in the case of the events that took place up on the pipeline Morris River last fall and the reprehensible and despicable attack on the police vehicles that took place uh, just recently, that there is an ongoing RCMP investigation into that. And that member knows that. And the police are doing everything they can to ensure that those responsible for those acts are brought to justice and charged and prosecuted. Investigations don't just happen with a wave of a wand or a flick of a switch. They need to be thorough and comprehensive to put together a strong case and to somehow suggest that because the police have yet to lay charges or conclude their investigation, that that does not matter to government or that is being dismissive of public safety is erroneous and the member should know that. Member for Prince George Wilmot, supplemental. What this member does know is that in community after community across British Columbia, people feel afraid, they feel unsafe, and they want this government to do something and take action to deal with that in their communities. Every single day in this House and in British Columbia, there is one serious issue after another. And in fact, we have an Attorney General that continues to fail to do his job. Let's talk about his record when it comes to uh, the job that he's done. His MOU with only the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs, we've heard very little about any progress that he has made. He was paid $142,000 as a facilitator, and apparently that was a complete waste of money. And his soft on crime approach has done nothing more than embolden criminals in British Columbia. Frankly, he has been hopeless on this file, and it is time that he stepped up and did his job. So a simple question to the Attorney General, when will violent criminals who are causing havoc start to fail, feel consequences again in British Columbia? Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are, of course, working with the Wet'suwet'en. We have tried to get them to agree to, with the federal government, to attend a summit. We continue to hope that that will take place. Mr. Speaker, the root of this problem, as the member well knows, is the decision of the Supreme Court in the uh, delgamuk gastewe case, a case which, with which we've been working with the hereditary chiefs in the Wet'suwet'en, as well as the other members, elected chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en, for many years. It's no secret to this House that there's great disagreement on the issue of the pipeline. Notwithstanding that, we are trying to find a way forward using a memorandum of understanding approach, and we will continue to try to get those negotiations concluded in the interests of everyone in this province. Member for City South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For over six months, we've called for a directive to prosecutors to put community safety ahead of the criminal's right to reoffend, But just like the pushback experienced by their own expert, Doug Lepard, the NDP continue to push back on our call to get tough with violent, prolific offenders who breach their conditions over and over again. 
The next Premier's own hand-picked expert, Doug Lepard, confirmed this is a unique BC problem because of government policy not to remand violent, prolific offenders. Will the Attorney General table the legal advice he is relying on to avoid taking action on violent, prolific offenders? Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, uh, I thank the Honourable Member for her question. On Friday, I had the opportunity after question period to speak to Mr. Lepard, and I can confirm that we are very much on the same page. My counterparts in other provinces agree that repeat violent offenders, uh, people out on bail, is an issue across this country, an unintended consequence of federal bail reforms and Supreme Court decisions. To clarify, the data that Mr. Lepard commented on was for total remand populations, not the specific to people who'd committed repeat violent offences. More recent Statistics Canada data, in fact, shows that fully half of the provinces and territories have fewer people in remand than before the pandemic. Repeat violent offences are an issue across Canada. And, Mr. Speaker, the Conservative Manitoba Justice Minister, Kelvin Gertson, said after our meetings in Halifax the following. The Manitoba government came with a clear message that too many violent offenders are being granted bail only to then victimize someone else while on bail. I was pleased that all provinces agreed that there needs to be changes to federal bail provisions in order to protect our communities. Mr. Speaker, this is a problem that has to be addressed on a national basis. We are doing so. Working, I'm determined to get the federal government to step up and do their part in bail reform and address this issue, just as we are working closely with local governments to make sure we have the supports needed, the enforcement measures necessary to take concrete action. There will be announced, there will be discussion later with our colleagues across government so we can have an all of government response and things will be announced shortly. Member for Surrey South. Supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm glad to hear that the um, Attorney General is on the same page as uh, Doug Lepard, and he must agree then that they have been pushing back on stricter bail conditions for violent, prolific offenders that are putting our communities at risk by breaching their conditions over and over again. And you know what, Mr. Speaker, it's happening every day all over this province. Recently in Prince George, a prolific offender with a history of dangerous driving and trying to flee police was released and then rammed three police vehicles. Last week in Victoria, a woman was sitting in the living room of her own home when rocks smashed through her window, hitting and cutting her face in another violent random attack. And on the weekend in Vancouver, five people were stabbed in less than an hour. A man was slashed in the face and another victim in Chinatown was attacked by a stranger with a knife. Since the incoming soft on crime premier was named premier designate, nearly 50 people have been the victims of random violent attacks in Vancouver. How many more victims must be assaulted before the NDP puts the rights of people to feel safe in their communities above the rights of violent, prolific offenders to continue to cause harm in these communities? Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. Thank Minister. you. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. It's funny I hear across the way commenting because I stood up, and it's funny because the member across the way was complaining the other day that I don't stand up. So, you know, I guess you can't keep the opposition happy, Honourable Speaker. Anyway, I thank the, uh, the Honourable Member uh, for her question, and I want to point out a number of things. That, uh, first off, we take this issue incredibly seriously. That's why we worked with local government to put together the Lepard Report, to put in place uh, what additional recommendations that government could be initiating to deal with the situation. Because it is unacceptable that there are random stranger attacks. And police are doing everything that they can to deal with that. At the same time, what we have also seen, and that we, don't, that we recognize that these types of crimes that we're seeing involve often people with mental and health substance abuse addictions and violent criminal records. That's one stream. We also see the antisocial behavior that we saw the other night uh, in downtown Vancouver, which is caused by people drinking far too much, confrontation with groups of people that know each other, 
and the police are dealing with that as well. They made a series of arrests and charges uh, in relation to, that, to those events. But what we also want to do, Honourable Speaker, is that we can change the laws, see changes in the laws that have brought unintended consequences that, make it, that have made it difficult to deal with some of those violent offenders that concern all of us in this House. That's why it was crucial that we had the meeting that we did in Halifax, where every single Solicitor General, Attorney General from across the, prom, from across the country and the provinces and the territories all agreed that we need Ottawa to make some significant changes that allow us to deal with some of these issues. As I've said before to the Honourable Member, we have reverse onus when it comes to firearms. We'd like to see that on other kinds of weapons as well, that people engage in violent attacks on people. And we are determined to make that happen. Just as we're determined to make sure that there's the supports in place to deal with the mental health and substance abuse problems that people are facing, Honourable Speaker. It is a comprehensive approach that's been taken. It's a comprehensive approach that this government is committed to. And it is a comprehensive approach involving local government, the province and the federal government that we are going to continue to work to until we get the results that all of us want to see. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Last week, the incoming Premier said, and I quote, we cannot continue to subsidize fossil fuels. We cannot continue to expand fossil fuel infrastructure and hit our climate goals." End quote. This seems like a pretty clear statement, Honourable Speaker, but I would like to get it on the record in the House through you to the Minister of Mines. Can he assure the public that there will be no phase two expansion of LNG Canada? Minister of Energy and Mines. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. In fact, our government elimin eliminated the largest fossil fuel subsidy in BC, the Deep Well Royalty Program. We've also eliminated other outdated and efficient programs, such as the marginal well, the ultra marginal well, the low productivity well rate production, and the cl clean growth infrastructure royalty programs. Those, pro those, uh, those royalty programs have been eliminated. And in fact, uh, that, that was noticed, uh, and we received uh, some recognition from uh, uh, the members of the public. Uh, this one may be familiar. Uh, let me read it, and I'll identify the person afterwards. Kudos to the Ministry of Energy, Mines, and Low Carbon Innovation and the BC NDP for eliminating the deep well royalty credit in BC. This was the most egregious BC Liberal oil and gas sector handout BC ever saw. Literally, BC gave out more credits and it earned in royalties. That was Andrew Weaver on Twitter, May 23, 2022. Leader of the Third Party Supplemental. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I guess some things never get tired for this government. However, what they aren't tired of is not answering questions, apparently. I didn't ask about oil and gas subsidies. I asked about whether LNG Canada will be expanding into phase two, which would be entirely contrary to what their incoming Premier has said on the record, which is we cannot continue to expand fossil fuel infrastructure and hit our climate goals. Let's see what others are saying about this government's climate record. Last week, they got an F on their climate change report. They have known who the incoming Premier will be for months. They all support him. Surely they should be able to answer this straightforward question about his priorities and I'm assuming their government priorities. Uh, but perhaps because this government is meeting with the owners of LNG Canada regularly and LNG Canada very much intends to expand to phase two of, of its uh, plant, despite the fact that LNG Canada will make it impossible for us to meet our targets, despite the fact that this province is experiencing climate crises on all fronts. Honourable Speaker, my question again is to the Energy Minister of Energy and Mines. Will there be an expansion to Phase 2 of LNG Canada in BC? Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, in this uh, very turbulent time when energy security is vital around the world, 
and yet our climate targets are very important as well. It's, it's vital that we strike a balance between those two objectives. As government, our role is not only to work with LNG projects on their permit requests, but importantly to ensure that these projects benefit all British Columbians by providing jobs and training opportunities for the people who call British Columbia home, providing British Columbians with a fair return on our resources, respecting and forming meaningful partnerships with First Nations, and meeting world-class standards and best practices for environmental protection. And by that, I mean our Clean BC program. No project will proceed unless it fits within the emission targets set out by Clean BC. Member for Vancouver, Langara. Mr. Speaker, last week we learned from the Minister of Tourism that the Premier designate has abruptly slammed the door on the Indigenous led 2030 Olympic bid, the first of its kind in the world. Blindsided is how Chief Wayne Sparrow of the Musqueam Nation describes the decision. To the Minister, when did the Premier designate make his decision to kill this Indigenous led Olympic bid? And why weren't First Nations allowed to meet with the next Premier before he made his decision? Minister. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And I want to begin my answer by first thanking the four first host nations, as well as the Olympic Committee here in Canada. They mounted what is an incredible bid, the first First Nations-led bid. And it's a model that truly deserves to be applauded, and one that I hope the IOC takes a look at moving forward. I know the nations are extraordinarily disappointed. This was a difficult decision. We were asked by the committee, uh, after we received their proposal just a few weeks ago, to provide a letter of support to move forward into the next tar targeted dialogue for the Olympics. After Cabinet reviewed uh, that proposal, we ultimately decided that the costs and the risks compared with the benefits, as well as the priorities that our government is focused on, like health care, like public safety, like education, we ultimately decided this wasn't the right time to pursue the bid. And I know that's extraordinarily disappointing to the nations. Um, we are sitting here in, in Victoria right now, so uh, I did meet with the nations on Monday uh, to relay Cabinet's decision and offered a further follow-up meeting to the nations to talk through de the decision if they wish. And uh, I, I remain excited to work with them on all aspects of reconciliation moving forward. Member for Vancouver, Langara, supplemental. Mr. Speaker, it's a simple question. And nobody believes this wasn't a decision of the tainted incoming Premier who spent day after day protesting member, the 2010 Olympics member, member, as a member, radical activist. Member, member of Vancouver, Langara, I encourage members not to get personal. We're referring, we don't, Mr. We don't Speaker, need to, to the incoming use Premier. this kind of language in the House. Let's be respectful. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's important, though, Mr. Speaker, to understand why the incoming Premier wouldn't even meet with the four host First Nations leading the bid prior to killing the bid. It was highly disrespectful not to do so. Councillor Wilson Williams of the Squamish Nation calls it a kick in the teeth and says, quote, we were suffocated in a true colonial process, end quote. Again, to the Tourism Minister, when did the Premier designate make his decision, and why didn't he even respond to the First Nations requesting a meeting? Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. So this journey has been uh, a year long in the making. We were approached by the nations a year ago about the province possibly supporting a bid for 2030. That work has been ongoing for a year along with the, alongside the nations, the municipalities, and the tourism partners. We received the host proposal in the past two weeks. Cabinet reviewed that proposal, and Cabinet made a decision that ultimately the $2 billion in direct costs and risks were just far too great and that we would not be able to pursue the bid at this time. I relayed that information to the nations and have provided uh, um, an opportunity for them to meet with me in person to discuss that if they wish 
and I'll continue to work those, with those nations moving forward. We're doing work on reconciliation every Members. single day in our government, whether that means the historic uh, event we had last week here uh, in the legislature, where we returned, removed the barriers for jurisdictions for children and families uh, to be covered by the nations. You know, these, this is work we're doing every single day, Honourable Speaker, and we're going to keep doing that. Opposition House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, it, it's, it's outrageous in these very simple questions to hear the Minister uh, respond uh, by essentially refusing to, to acknowledge uh, that what we're, at, we're getting at here is uh, when did the Premier designate make the decision to cancel this project? It is, it is out, an outrageous assertion that the, that the Premier uh, designate uh, had nothing to do with this. Uh, just like he had nothing to do with rigging the NDP's leadership race or nothing to do with ripping four days out of the parliamentary calendar. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Right? Yeah. Members, let's, let's hear the question, please. Let's hear the question. It, it's, it just doesn't pass the smell test at all uh, to, to, the, to the members opposite. Uh, prior, prior to this decision, First Nations had actually written to the incoming Premier. They wrote to him and urged, uh, urged him to meet with them to discuss any concerns that he might have with the bid. And the respect that they were shown by the incoming Premier was not to get back to them, not to meet them, and then to have the rug pulled out from underneath them. First Nations don't want to actually hear from the Tourism Minister. They want a meeting with, they wanted a meeting with the incoming Premier. They want to hear from the incoming Premier. Mr. Speaker, but given, uh, given the, the incoming Premier's radical past, it's, it's no surprise that uh, he decided to kill this uh, Indigenous-led Olympic bid. He sided with anarchists uh, trying to disrupt the 2010 Games and boasted about his, quote, resistance to the oppressive Olympic agenda, end quote. He was even fear-mongering that the Olympics back then would turn BC into, quote, a police state, end quote. So can the Minister uh, tell this House if the incoming Premier refused to meet with First Nations before killing the Indigenous-led Games because he continues to believe the Olympics would turn BC into a police state? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I, I reject every premise that the member just spoke of. <laughs> In fact, it makes me a little sad and a little worried, actually, too, because I clearly don't understand how the BC Liberals operate and how they would operate a government, because here, in our government, this is a cabinet decision. This isn't a top-down decision. This is a cabinet decision. Members, members, members. Members? Thank you, Member. Minister will continue. Thank you. Uh, the, um, this is a cabinet level decision. We were asked by the nations to provide a letter of support for November. That is the timeline we were working on uh, as the next checkpoint to move into targeted dialogues uh, with the International Olympic Committee. Cabinet reviewed the host proposal. Ultimately, we had to take a look at whether the costs and the, and the risks of, of over $2 billion uh, could weigh in with the benefits as well as the priorities that we have in government. We've made very clear commitments to the people of British Columbia about the things we need to focus on, like health care, like education, like housing. And we're going to continue to work on those things. We're also going to continue to work alongside all nations on reconciliation across this province, whether it be you know, doubling forestry revenues uh, being shared with First Nations as part of our co-developed new forestry revenue sharing model, whether it be um, sharing gaming grant money, uh, 7%. $350 million already uh, shared with the nations. This is the important work that we do every single day in our government, and we're going to continue to do that work. Opposition House Leader Supplemental. 
Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to re reconciliation, this government always has the right words. They always know what to say publicly. But then when, what happens behind closed doors is certainly not a, a demonstration of what reconciliation is all about. First Nations pursued this bid. It was the first Indigenous-led Olympic Games bid in the world. And they were led down a, a path by this, by this government uh, for over a year. But while the incoming Premier made time to door knock for uh, the NDP Mayor of Vancouver, he delayed killing the Indigenous-led bid until after the municipal elections. The reality is, he made his position clear as a radical protester of the 2010 Games. At that time, while anarchists engaged in rioting, looting, property damage, and assaulting police officers, the incoming Premier stood by them and actually gave them legal advice on how to sue the police. He even called for a boycott of Olympic sponsors and described the Games as, quote, a spectacle that will turn our city into a near police state, end quote. So again, a simple question to the Minister of Tourism. Can the Minister tell this House if the incoming Premier continues to boycott anything related to the Olympics, and is that why he refused to even meet with First Nations prior to pulling the rug out from under them with respect to the Olympics? Minister. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And that's just simply over-the-top nonsense from the opposition. Don't make decisions, cabinet make decisions. Members, and members, our cabinet members. reviewed the hosting proposal that we received in the past couple of weeks and made the decision that it was simply not the right time to support the 2030 bid. We need to focus on our priorities that the people of British Columbia expect us to, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, that's certainly not nonsense. All one needs to do is look that up, and, uh, and we'll find quotes all over. Um, now, this is so disrespectful. First Nations have put so much work, years of work, into this Indigenous-led Olympic bid, the first of its kind in the world. The minister herself says it's exceptional, it's amazing. Um, yet, the anti-Olympics premier uh, didn't even give them an opportunity to be at the table and has refused to answer any questions about his decision. Dennis Thomas of the Suelitas says, quote, a unilateral decision without any of our input or feedback, end quote. Shame. Shame. Why did the tainted incoming Premier make this decision unilaterally with such utter disrespect for First Nations in British Columbia? Minister. Thank you, Chair. And what was disrespectful was having a referendum on whether Indigenous peoples wow. has rights. Members, members, let's hear that. Minister, will, minister has the floor. Please continue. Thank you, Speaker. I understand how deeply disappointed the nations are. This was an exciting bid, and I absolutely applaud the four nations as well as the uh, Canadian Olympic Committee on the work that they've done over this past year. This is truly a remarkable model. It's something that sh you know, should be recognized and used again uh, by the Olympic Committee moving forward. Ultimately, Cabinet was asked to make a decision for November. We were provided the host proposal in the past few weeks. Cabinet reviewed that proposal, and we had to take a look at the costs and the benefits, the risks to the province. And ultimately, we decided it was simply not the right time. We're going to continue our work on reconciliation. We are moving forward on important areas all across 
our government, whether that be uh, investing in language revitalization and protection, whether that be increasing the uh, Indigenous um, graduation rates uh, for, for education, whether that be sharing our gaming revenue and, and forestry revenues, as we talked about. We're going to keep doing that work every single day because we believe in true reconciliation. Member for Kamloops, North Thompson. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The cold reality is that this tourism minister has a, a track record of, of somewhat implausible claims. Um, you know, whether it's not being forthright about the bungled BC bid system, the role in the disastrous billion dollar vanity museum project, pretending she was consulting about an FOI fee when the decision had already been made. Mr. Speaker, the NDP have earned the title for being the most secretive government in Canada and nobody believes their claims as to why this decision was made. It was made, let's be clear, by a radical incoming Premier because of his dislike of the oppressive Olympics, in his words. Because let's be clear, Mr. Speaker, about how we got to this point. The outgoing Premier, the outgoing Premier actually met with the proponents of this Indigenous-led Olympic bid at the front end. They left that meeting feeling they had his support and encouragement to pursue the bid. Now, two weeks ago, everything changed. Suddenly, we have the tainted incoming Premier. Member, please. No. Continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're, we're, to be clear, we're, we're, not, we're speaking of the process that was tainted. Yeah. Members? 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 Let's conclude the question period, okay? Please. Thank Member you. will continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So let's be clear this was the very first decision of the incoming anti Olympics Premier, and he has yet to answer a single question or be accountable to this House, and in fact, the public and the Indigenous communities about this decision. Again, when will the Premier designate, provide the information to this House that he based the decision on, not the Cabinet? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. And, and I, I really don't know how much clearer I can make it to the opposition. I don't know how the BC Liberals operate, but over here, Cabinet makes decisions, and Cabinet ultimately reviewed the package we had before us. We had a November timeline that was provided Mem as part members, of the House Members, 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 Minister will conclude. Thank you. And we ultimately uh, made the decision that we were unable to support the Games at this time. We are going to continue to work alongside the nations as we move forward. We're going to continue uh, to, to support reconciliation in all ways across the government. And we're going to continue to support uh, and take a look at bids as they come forward for international sporting events, because that's how we operate. The bell ends the question period, Madam Clerk.